I'd now like to introduce Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the US National Institutes of Health, where he's still in the lab. He serves as one of the key advisors to the White House and Department of Health and Human Services on global HIV AIDS issues and on initiatives to bolster medical and public health preparedness against emerging infectious disease threats. He's been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of Science, and the IAS President's Award, among many others. And he's going to present on COVID-19 and the research response. Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Anton. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to give a, a broad overview, which hopefully will complement the presentations of my colleagues uh, leading up to a discussion. So let me start off by an introduction to the topic itself. Uh, no disclosures as usual. Uh, let's take a look. I think everybody appreciates it now that at the end of December of uh, 2019, a cluster of cases appeared which were felt to be originating in a wet market in Wuhan, but subsequent investigation indicated that in fact, there were human to human transmission likely weeks before. But in the first week of January, the Chinese identified a new strain of coronavirus, put the sequence on a database, which led to a surge of research on this virus, including vaccines, which we'll talk about in just a moment. What I'm gonna do over the next couple of minutes is just almost like a motion picture, go through with you how this infection, now a true historic pandemic, has evolved over the weeks and months until we are right now. This was the global spread, as you could see, as in most heat maps, the lighter pink is the lower level of cases. And as we get to the dark red, you see what happens as we go from this to this, to this, to this, and here, and here. And truly what we saw before us was the somewhat frightening, but nonetheless real emergence of a true global pandemic. It just went on and on and got worse and worse and worse and worse. It seemed that whatever we did in different parts of the world, there were responses that were sometimes favorable in that countries got it under control. But as you can see from this slide here, my own country, the United States, as I'm sure we'll be able to discuss a little bit more, is in the middle right now, even as we speak, in a very serious problem. And these were the latest numbers as of yesterday, 11 million cases and over a half a million deaths globally with the distribution shown by the size of the circles. In January, when we first heard about that, I wrote a perspective viewpoint in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I was not trying to be facetious, but I wanted to point out to those not familiar with coronaviruses that indeed we often thought of this as one of the common causes of the common cold, and this is absolutely not the case. But if one takes a look at the basic biology, you see at the phylogenetic tree of coronaviruses, there are four common coronaviruses that account for about 15 to 30 percent of the recurrent common colds. In 2002, we were confronted with SARS out of China, and then in 2012, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. But what we're talking about today is yet again the third pandemic coronavirus, which we refer to as SARS coronavirus 2. The virology is simple, since we know a lot about coronaviruses. It's a beta coronavirus, as I mentioned, phylogenetically related to SARS of 2002. It has four structural proteins. The important one is the S protein or the spike protein upon which virtually all of the vaccine uh, um, attempts are now focused on this. The receptor was originally identified with SARS in 2002, and that's the ACE2 
cellular receptor. Regarding transmissibility, we've learned painfully now that this is a highly, highly efficient transmitter from person to person. By respiratory droplets, still some question about aerosol, but likely some degree of aerosol. Infected surfaces, it's been shown, can live for variable periods of time. Virus found in different body fluids, but the role in transmission is still unclear. Animals, including domesticated, have been infected, but has not been shown to be a major source of human infection. Importantly, and this has evolved over the months because it was not clear early on and has changed the way we think about transmission and control in that about 40 to 45% of individuals infected are asymptomatic. There is transmission by asymptomatic and presymptomatic individuals to uninfected individuals, which clearly complicates greatly attempts at contact tracing and isolation. The clinical manifestations we learn more about literally on a daily and weekly basis. They are protean. When we first had a um, experience with HIV AIDS, as so many of us have had watching these presentations, remember how it evolved over years, things that we saw that we were not aware of until we had a significant number of individuals. The incubation period has a wide range, two to 14 days, but most of it is really around four to five days. The clinical presentation is shown here from a recent um, a source at WHO. Fever is not in inevitable and sometimes can be misleading by the absence of fever. There's cough, fatigue, anorexia, shortness of breath, myalgias truly starting off in many cases as a flu-like syndrome. The unusual situation is the loss of smell and taste, which precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms in some individuals. This is the thing that has, I would say, puzzled, but also disturbed me the most and may lead to some misunderstanding as to the seriousness of disease. I have never seen a virus in which the same pathogen with little change has a range from no symptoms in up to 40% of individuals, mild illness in others requiring virtually no care, others going to bed at home for weeks, others having symptoms that persist for weeks and months, some requiring hospitalization, oxygen, intubation, uh, uh, and a variety of other interventions, and in fact, death in a substantial proportion of those at risk with underlying conditions who get critically ill. It is extraordinary that range of involvement with disease from nothing to death. The case fatality rate in a recent uh, a publication from JAMA with severe disease is about 2.3% globally, a bit confusing because of the lack of complete understanding of the extent of asymptomatic infection. The case fatality rate is somewhere around 1%. People at increased risk for severe illness, categories, older adults, and people of any age who have certain underlying conditions. The underlying medical conditions that are strongly associated with an increased risk for a severe outcome, kidney disease, obstructive pulmonary disease, immunocompromised state, such as with solid organ transplantation, obesity, heart conditions, sickle cell disease, and type two diabetes the conditions that may with variable degrees of increased risk for severe covirate illness are shown on this slide. Hypertension seems to be predominant among them, but as you can see, a variety of others here. And remember I said that may confer increased risk because the story is not yet completely out in individuals with HIV. Those with HIV that's not controlled in the sense of control of iremia versus those that have good control. And that knowledge store is still evolving. Here in the United States, we have a, a significant issue with a disproportionate disparity of serious illness among our minority population, particularly African-American, Latinx, and Native Americans. The, the non-pulmonary complications, and again, we learn more and more about this, even as people are trying to recover 
with neurological disorders, cardiac dysfunction, a strange hypercoagulable state, and a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, highly reminiscent of Kawasaki's disease. Very briefly, the therapeutic landscape is beginning to expand. These are some of the investigational therapeutics that have either been tried in clinical trials or about to go into clinical trials. I'll get back to remdesivir in a moment. There are other broad spectrum antivirals, a lot of work being done right now on convalescent plasma. We don't have the bottom line on that yet, but with clinical trials, hopefully we will. Hyperimmune immunoglobulin, other repurposed drugs. You know the story of hydroxychloroquine. There's immune-based therapy, and importantly, a lot of hope being put into monoclonal antibodies, both for treatment and for prevention. Just a word on remdesivir. It was a randomized placebo-controlled trial in hospitalized patients with lung disease, over a thousand patients throughout the world, which showed a significant but modest, a modest diminution in the time to recovery. Dexamethasone from the UK, again, another randomized controlled trial, which showed a significant impact on mortality in people with advanced disease, either ventilated, those requiring oxygen, but interestingly, earlier patients had no benefit and possibly some harm, which fits into what we know about the pathogenesis of getting at the virus early on, but getting at the aberrant inflammatory response later on. In the United States and others have done this, we've developed a living document of treatment guidelines, which is updated regularly, depending on what is known in the literature, as well as preliminary reports to help clinicians in their approach to patients. As you can see, this can be easily accessed online by COVID-19 treatmentguidelines.nih.gov. And finally, with regard to vaccines, the approach that we are taking in the United States and various approaches throughout the world is what we call a strategic approach because we know we have multiple candidates that are being tested in the United States and certainly elsewhere to try and get a harmonization of protocols to ask the same question with a common DSMB, common immunological parameters, and common primary and secondary endpoints. And finally, this last slide just gives you a, 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 an idea of the landscape of the multiple different platforms that are being pursued and where they are in various stages of phases of trials. As many of you know, this summer, several will be starting to go into a phase three trial, some within the next several weeks, some in the middle and the end of the summer, and even in other countries, some have already started. So I'll stop there and hopefully we'll have some time for questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Please stay connected for the discussion that we conducted after all the presentations have been made. I'd now like to introduce Professor Salim Abdul Karim, who will present on pivoting the COVID-19 prevention paradigm from anxiety to cells efficacy. Professor Salim Abdul Karim is a South African clinical infectious disease epidemiologist, widely recognized for scientific contributions to HIV prevention and treatment. He's the director of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, known as CAPRISTA in Durban, and CAPRISTA Professor of Global Health at Columbia University. He's a chair of the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 and member of the Africa Task Force for Coronavirus. He's also a member of the Lancet Commission on COVID-19. Professor Karim. Thank you very much, Dr. Posniak. It's indeed a pleasure and an honor to be with you here in this important session. I hope to take off from where Dr. Fauci has touched on the issues relating to prevention, and I'm going to specifically talk about pivoting the prevention paradigm and moving from anxiety to self-efficacy. I have no conflicts of interest to report. Just by way of background, how it all began, I think we received the first signal that there's a potential for coronavirus to infect humans when the bat coronavirus through civet cats infected humans in what was then called SARS back in 2002. We received another signal about a decade later when another bat coronavirus using the uh, camels as an intermediate host called uh, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And so now, eight years later, we're dealing with the SARS coronavirus too. 
we know, and from the evidence we have the, from the genetic homology that it originates from bats, and it's thought that the pangolins were the intermediate host before it entered into humans. And one of the central features that distinguishes it from SARS and MERS, which never really spread much beyond the initial epidemic, the difference is in the high affinity ACE2 receptor binding capability of the spike protein. That distinction is what enables this virus to spread so rapidly from human to human. Whereas both SARS and MERS had a low affinity ACE2 receptor, SARS coronavirus 2 has a high affinity receptor. When we think about the first announcement of this disease and how we've come through in a matter of just seven months, it's quite stunning to think about that 188 countries have reported cases, over 10 million and over half a million deaths. So let's look very briefly now at the three key modes of transmission. The first is from person to person contact. We now know quite clearly that because the nose and the back of the throat have cells with the ACE2 receptor, the virus is able to attach to those cells, replicate and create millions of viruses. Those viruses are expelled through the mouth when a person speaks, coughs, sneezes, and just simply exhales. And little droplets ranging from about 100 microns to all the way to very small droplets, less than five microns, are put out through the mouth. An individual who is close to another who is infected is at risk when those droplets fall onto them. And so person-to-person -person contact is important. Let's illustrate this from a, an outbreak that occurred in a South Korean call center where the workstations are organized in tables and 13 workstations to a table. In the middle picture at the bottom, you see how one individual who was infected led to nine others on that table acquiring the virus. Indeed, if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, you see how this virus has spread so rapidly through this call center, where 79 of the 137 employees tested positive. It was shown that prolonged close contact played a crucial role. It's contact that exceeds 15 to 30 minutes seems to be important in whether one acquires this infection or not. So beyond person-to-person -person contact, which is thought to be the predominant mode of transmission, we also have a situation where the little droplets can contaminate surfaces. We know from various studies that the virus on these surfaces can last for varying periods of time. So while it does not survive very long in copper and to a lesser extent in cardboard, but on surfaces like stainless steel and plastic survives three to four days. And we've seen how a single individual with this infection can lead to such a widespread contamination of the environment. In this article from JAMA, this patient uh, is sitting in, uh, in a bed in a ward the samples that were tested showed that the bed rail had the virus, the chair next to the bed, the light switches that were behind the bed had the virus, the, the doctor's stethoscope, the air outlet fan, the door handle, the toilet bowl surface. It's ubiquitous. An infected individual contaminates the surface and it lasts for varying periods of time depending on that surface. A person touching it acquires that virus and the virus we know survives for a short period, somewhere between five and 15 minutes on hand, and then self-inoculates when that person touches their own mouth, nose or eyes. The third mechanism of transmission is what we call airborne transmission. And then in this particular instance, these small particles, five microns or less. These can sort of float in the air and remain in the air for fairly long periods. The exact role of airborne transmission is not settled. It has been shown to be a factor, but the extent to which it occurs is unclear. We know these aerosols can survive for a few hours in the air. And we know from another study, it's not yet published, that when you look at the surfaces and even distant surfaces, now no longer those that are within the one and a half meter range or six feet range of an individual, we see 
the uh, the contamination occurring even in distant points. Let me use one particular example. So in a restaurant in Guangzhou in China, in patient zero on the left-hand side is seated at table A. This particular individual had just returned from Wuhan the day before. And when we look at a few days later, how patient zero led to nine individuals across the three, uh, three tables, his own table and two neighboring table uh, becoming infected. What was intriguing was that some of these patients were more than a meter away from patient zero. The subsequent investigation in the right-hand side picture shows that the air conditioning is thought to play a major role. That when the airflow in the recirculating air conditioner picks up the little uh, floating droplets, the very small ones, it is then able to spread it across the three tables leading to this infection. So we understand these three modes of transmission, but there is so much we don't understand. It is things that we're just beginning to grapple with in terms of understanding its epidemiology and the biology that underpins how this virus is transmitted. For example, current evidence shows that three to four weeks later, the Black Lives Matter protests just haven't caused an uptick in COVID-19 cases. It's left to be seen whether this still holds true, but the current evidence suggests this. Is it that this virus did not survive well in the exterior? Is it that we really have to be most concerned about confined spaces? That's what this suggests. We will learn more as we do more and more studies and unravel the epidemiology of this virus. But what do we know? We know we do have a coronavirus prevention toolbox. We have social distancing, hand hygiene, cloth masks as the mainstays of what we have, environmental cleaning, testing and isolation. And as we look at each situation, we use combinations of these prevention tools to address it. So in a workplace, we make sure we do symptom screening in the morning before people can even arrive at work. We make sure that they put on their cloth mask and maintain social distancing in the travel that they do to work. So in each setting, we can draw on the combinations of these tools so that we can address each of these challenges. But let's look at one of the challenges that we've been grappling with and one of the tools that has seemed to be used to a great extent, and that's the lockdown. Because when this initial infection occurred, we were not able to follow our traditional public health paradigm. Our pub public health paradigm is we understand the way the virus spreads, we develop the ways in which we can slow it down or stop it, and then we develop our messaging, we pilot test it, we then introduce it to our early adopters, and then we wait for diffusion. If we did all of that, we would just miss the boat on this virus. And so we had to act quickly. Well, how has our world changed in the last four months? In the blue are countries that have no restrictions. In the yellow are countries that have some optional restrictions. And in the orange, we have countries that have sub substantial stay-at-home restrictions, including the dark orange, where we have strict lockdowns. On the 1st of March, this is what our world looked like. On the 1st of April, changed completely. 86 countries on national or sub-national lockdowns. Look at the situation a month later on the 1st of May. And then on the 1st of June, you now see China is back to being uh, on a strict lockdown. Australia and New Zealand have no restrictions. Africa is easing restrictions. South America still has restrictions. We go to the 1st of July and see how our country is changing even more. Our country has changed, our countries and our world has changed so dramatically over the last four months. So what has the impact of these lockdowns been? I've chosen to compare South Africa to some countries that have the most substantial epidemics and some countries that have you know, quite uh, much less severe epidemics, South Korea and Australia. And if you look at South, South Africa, what becomes clear is the way in which the epidemic has grown somewhat differently. And that difference is evident when we look at 
the way in which the lockdown changed the transmission of the virus. So in the three weeks that we had this epidemic from our first case, our doubling time was every two days. From the institution of the lockdown and the state of disaster a few days earlier, on the 26th of March, we slowed the viral transmission rate down to a doubling time of 15 days. And currently, as we are easing the lockdown restriction, we are now doubling at 12 days. Give you some idea of the, the way in which we were able to flatten that curve initially. But the virus is now spreading at a rapid rate. Easing restrictions is just the way in which this virus is now able to spread. And we are seeing within South Africa several super spreading events. And indeed, some of the early transmission occurred in grocery stores and supermarkets, which were open under the strict lockdown. Let me end off on one of the challenges we are all going through. We instituted an initial intervention of state using the institutional power of the state to ask people to please stay at home. That created anxiety. People watched on television. In South Africa, they watched how the situation was unfolding in Italy, how it was unfolding in New York. And they began to see the challenges and the deaths that they were being caused. And so we used that authority, we used that capability initially. And anxiety was created, concern was created, but now we are asking people to live with this virus, to find a way that they can coexist because livelihoods are as important. And so we're asking people to take agency, to create their own power, their own willingness to take action. And that action is through a mask, through social distancing and all of the other things. And as we do that, we are hoping to achieve collective action because it's through our collective action that we make a difference. That when we wear masks, we are saying to the world, not only are we caring for ourselves, we are caring for you. Our risk, each person's risk, means that we're putting our families at risk, we're putting our neighbors at risk, we're putting our communities at risk. And so in some communities, for example, in South Africa, we are built on the principle of Ubuntu which is, I am because you are. And as we reflect on that, I'd like to just conclude by saying that effective prevention is built on our ability to address all three modes of transmission. Our prevention toolbox is quite well stacked, but it really needs a vaccine. We desperately wish every success to all of those candidates currently in, uh, in development and in testing. And we need to continue learning. We need to understand more about this virus each day. Lockdowns we've seen can slow viral transmission and even achieve temporary containment, but they are really not sustainable over long periods. We have so much to learn about how to use these tools in different ways from our toolbox. As we shift from restrictions to living with the virus, we're gonna to need to pivot our prevention paradigm, away from anxiety, away from concern, to believing we can make a difference. Each one of us can contribute, not only to protecting ourselves, but our entire societies. And those societies that embrace community, embrace individual interdependence, are best placed to successfully pivot under the concept in South Africa, which we call Ubuntu. Thank you. I'd like to thank Professor Karim and please stay with us because we're going to have a discussion after the final talk. I'd now like to introduce Ambassador Deborah Burks, who's going to present on COVID-19, aligning data and implementation for action. Ambassador Deborah Burks currently serves in the Office of the Vice President as the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator to aid in the whole of US government response to COVID-19. As an ambassador at large, Dr. Burks is also the coordinator of the United States government activities to combat HIV and AIDS and US Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. She's a world-renowned medical expert and leader in the field of HIV and AIDS, and a three-decade-long career has focused on HIV, immunology, vaccine research, and global health. As the Global AIDS Coordinator, Ambassador Bergs oversees the implementation of the United States President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, also known as PEPFAR. 
Thank you, Dr. Posniak, and it's so good to be with all of you today. And what a great lead in um, talking about the data and the aspects of the virus and ending with community, which I think is really the lesson learned that brings together the COVID-19 response and, the, and our HIV AIDS response. And I wanna thank the two prior speakers for framing this so well. I'm gonna go quickly through a set of slides that really highlights how we're approaching data in the United States. But just to remind people, the primary cases to date have really been in high and upper middle income countries. Um, and the, primarily the mortality has been in high income and increasing in upper middle income countries. This is a little bit different than we thought a respiratory pandemic would look like globally, as we thought that resource limited settings would be particularly hard hit. But because of their differences in comorbidities and their incredible um, young, youthful populations, they may have less mortality than many of the other countries in the high income and upper middle income strata. Just to remind people where we are overall, where the United States sits relevant to Brazil and Russia and now India and India, I'm sure at this moment has surpassed, really pointing out where this is actively spreading. In the United States, we have increased number of cases over the last particularly three weeks. We have not seen this result in increased mortality, but that is expected as the disease continues to spread in some of our large metro areas where comorbidities exist. So how do we look at this? Well, every state in the United States is different. And so this slide clearly illustrates that difference. You see right now that the epidemic is growing in the blue line, California, the green line, Texas, um, and the darker line, reddish line, Florida. But you can see that it spread earlier in New Jersey as shown on this slide, but now they have reached a very low level of case increases and the primary increases now have moved to California, Florida, Texas, and Arizona. We look at this through all of the states and you can see here um, Oregon and others increasing. And so that we look at it across all states and our District of Columbia. And then we also look at this graphically so we can see rate of change. And so this really looks at percentage of change over just the last seven days. And you can see the primary red areas across the Southern United States, which was a spared originally the first March, April cases that were very much more in the Northeast, Detroit and Chicago. Over the last four months, we've worked hard to expand testing, and that has allowed us to look very carefully at this issue of changes in percent positivity. It is that change in percent positivity shown by the red X's over the little blue triangle that alerts us that there's active and ongoing community spread. And you can see that very evident in Texas, Florida, California, South Carolina. And so this allows us to really focus our resources on expanding testing and community level testing to really deal with the asymptomatic group that we know is spreading the virus and may be linked specifically with age with increasing asymptomatic spread in the younger age groups. We then look at percent positivity over time. And again, this illustrates very well the change in increase in percent positivity that occurred in very early June in these, in these states of Texas, Arizona, and Florida, and really illustrates how this percent positivity of tests when you're doing large testing can really help us. You can see California now has reached over 10%, which is our cut line for really significant community spread. And then you can see other states have been, have a very low seropositivity, pushing mostly 5% in a stable way. And that's the rest of the United States at the current situation. Again, we look at percent positivity across the country and changes in percent positivity and the new positive results generated by our assays. And then the percent positives, and this really, the dark colors illustrate the percent positives that are over 10%. And again, United States is a state by state, county by county, and that's the way we've made our response, very much looking at a very granular level and then working with the governors and the mayors to have a very specific and tailored response for each of these areas. To give you an illustration of what this looks like in our daily reporting, this is what goes um, to multiple individuals on the task force in a daily way. 
Um, the real key to this is the positivity rate and the incidence. So looking at this blue line, which is the percent positives, which in Florida as a whole is at about 15%. And then looking at the cases, this is also looking at syndromic presentations, which is a little bit later than the increase in percent positives. And this is related to people coming to the emergency room or to clinics. Just to give you an idea then, we look down at the county level so that within the state, we can identify the counties that have the most rapid increase. And you can see in the case of Florida, it's Miami-Dade, followed by Broward and Palm Beach. But you can also see this recent increase in Hillsborough and Orange County. And again, this allows us to work directly with the county health authorities. And more importantly, as brought up by um, Dr. Karim, getting in and working directly with the communities so that we're communicating with the communities. This is what Texas looks like, and I'm just going to highlight some of our, um, country, our states with this expanding epidemic. And you can see for a very long time, Texas was very low um, at about 5% positivity rate, had a very small small um, increase back in the March, April timeframe, and then this very significant increase in test positivity and rising cases. The test positivity preceded the significant increase in cases that were documented. Um, and this is by county showing that the primary county um, with expanding cases is Harris County. This is our Houston area followed by Dallas, but there's a whole series of counties that are on a highlighted concern. And then this is California, which again had a very early shutdown, dropping test positivity, and then a very recent rise in test positivity. And again, in California, most of the cases are in the Los Angeles County area. And this is Arizona, which had a parallel increase in the test positivity earlier. So you can see much earlier than Texas or California or Florida. But again, this delay and in increasing ER presentations. We think this really represents our ability finally to pick up asymptomatic cases with that rising percent positivity. And I really want to thank our young people who have been coming out and getting tested even though they don't have symptoms. And in Arizona, the primary um, expansion is in Maricopa County, which is the Phoenix area. And then this is Wisconsin. So this can happen in a very subtle way. So you can see things are looking good. They're coming out of the lockdown. They have very low positivity rate of about two to 3%. And then you see this slow uptake of positivity and then expansion of new cases. And in Wisconsin, it's primarily the Milwaukee area. And so we look down at the metro areas um, just because the metro responses, what's happening in the cities is sometimes different than what's happening in the state as a whole because we have very rural counties in states. In fact, we still have states today with counties that have either no infections or have only had one infection since the beginning of the pandemic in the United States. And so this data is then triangulated, looking carefully at slope lines so that we can determine rate of increase, then looking carefully at rate of increase of test positivity. And you can see in this slide of Houston and Phoenix that are over 20%. And then you see Dallas and Tampa and the, the rising test positivity in Miami. And then these are the other metros, which are more stable um, with less than 10% positivity and that are very stable um, metros. So this is done every day so that we can understand what's happening across the country. This is obviously also mirrored in the individual state levels. This is what we look at at the metro level. So this look is looking at Miami. So again, you can see when this increased test positivity started, it predated a significant increase in the cases. All of these alert bars are created. So at a glance, you can flip through all of the metros in the United States with more than 500,000 inhabitants and really have a sense of where the virus is increasing or decreasing. This is Houston, similar, and this is Los Angeles and Phoenix and Milwaukee. So I think this gets back to what um, 
Dr. Karim talked about is, and Dr. Fauci talked about is the skewed demographics um, coming out of a report at the CDC's MMWR and the skewed demographics of significant increased disease among our Hispanic population followed by our African-American population. Of course, our Native American population has the highest attack rate. And we map this then against um, resources. And you can see the primary outbreaks are around both outpatient and inpatient, primarily the inpatient, this red line, are in individuals that have a household income of less than $25,000 a year. And so this is like HIV in that there are specific vulnerable groups, either by race, ethnicity, or their relationship in poverty. And so this is really allow the HIV type approach of really reaching people in the most vulnerable situations with increased testing and access to healthcare and really tailoring messages directly to those communities. We know from the work in Italy and as presented by Dr. Fauci, certainly hypertension and diabetes are critical comorbidity. If you look where those comorbidities exist in the United States, it's very much in the Mid-Atlantic and across our southern states. If you look at where our diabetes is and our increased diabetes, it's very much in the, in the Midwest and across our southern states. And then, of course, if you look at obesity, again, mirrored in across our southern states. So really increasing the messages to communities and critically getting testing to the communities. And I think this is something that has been done so extraordinarily well in HIV, where you have to find the asymptomatic individuals to stop community spread. Same principle in this respiratory disease. And I think early on that was hard for people to understand that we're used to um, having alerts related to actual illness rather than infection. And so bringing the skills of community work. So just to conclude, this is what our daily data summary looks like. I wanted you to all see how it translates um, down to a single slide um, with the data behind it. It shows where the increasing cases are, both by state and by metro. Right now, currently, four states account for more than 50% of all new cases and unfortunately increases in mortality. Um, currently, we have eight states that have over 1,000 cases a day. Um, and then we really believe that the uniform use of masks in all metros and in all areas with rising new infections, particularly counties and metros with over 5% positivity. We know as Dr. Slim Karim presented, there's a lot of indoor transmission. So we think um, when you have rising infections, closing those bars, limiting indoor dining and particularly increasing outdoor dining. Um, not sure that we have the full information from the protests yet because we are starting to see early rises um, in cases in some of our metro areas and we need to track that very carefully. Um, we then note which states are, have increased cases or rising test positivity. Right now we have 28 in addition to the 13 and 10 stable states. We have 154 counties that are on alert um, the United States has over 3,000. So this allows us again to constantly be looking at where the virus is by state, by county, by metro. And that only reason to have data is if it leads to very definitive action. And it's this kind of tailored approach working with governors and mayors that allows us to specifically go to individual states. I love the way um, Dr. Karim talked about cultures and different cultures. The United States has significant different cultures and approaches to health across the United States with indi individual um, independence and in some states greater than others. And so really calling and sending deployment teams directly to the what we call the hot states as well as the states that are between five and 10%, which we call the yellow states and alert to really work with the, down at the community level and meet with the community level as well as the state and local health officials. Um, we have a weekly call with all the governors and now have a comprehensive um, data sheets that go to them along with recommendations. And I just wanna leave you with a concept of, we really need to 
increase our footprint indirectly into the communities. As described, these are events that are happening sometimes in households, um, sometimes in multi-generational households, sometimes a party leading to significant spread. So making sure that we're getting information to the household and then expanding our testing to what we call household pool testing, which allows you to test an entire household with a single test and then go back to the households that are positive and isolate those individuals either in that household or in a hotel where multi-generational households, understanding that our risk reduction really needs to focus on improving the outcomes for the most vulnerable, identifying them, and then working together as Dr. Karim described, as a community of Americans, really protecting one another through our own agency. I love the way he put that where each of us can contribute to the health of the nation by wearing masks, reducing um, our indoor interactions, decreasing our gatherings and indoor settings, and moving a lot of our activities to outside. Obviously, we're working very hard to get remdesivir distributed in a very equitable way that goes out um, by the number of hospitalizations and then the work that we're doing um, to get plasma available. Um, so I want to just thank you for the opportunity to talk about how we're approaching this. And Dr. Fauci is a, is a daily colleague of mine to make sure that we're responding comprehensively to this um, virus as it circulates in the United States so we can prevent further community spread. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Burks. And, and now we're going to move to the uh, discussion part and I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Beira, to start with the first question. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Anton, and thanks to all three of the speakers. Let me just begin uh, by thanking you all for your extraordinary service uh, to this COVID response. You all have been uh, just remarkable leaders. Uh, I'd like to uh, take the first question uh, to Dr. Fauci. And uh, Dr. Fauci, you, you ended with vaccines, which we're all, of course, uh, very much uh, hoping are gonna be the most potent uh, tool in the uh, COVID tool kit uh, soon. Uh, I wonder if you could just speak uh, about uh, the strategic thinking of going uh, into trials with multiple platforms. So the nucleic acid platform, the viral vector, uh, and the protein subunits, uh, among others. Uh, and just articulate for us uh, the thinking behind that strategy. Well, it was a combination of things, Chris. We wanted to get out quickly. And some of the earlier ones, the mRNA, uh, were ones that we were able to get off the ground very quickly. There was experience with other diseases with the vector. And then there's the tried and true protein, which was the kind of thing that was behind temporally, but nonetheless, not any less important. So what was done, uh, at least at, this, at the level of the federal government, because there are so many others that are going about this independently, but the investment that was made by the United States government was try to subsidize the development of the product itself, but also to make available our clinical trial sites, which as you well know, which we built up over decades with HIV AIDS, to utilize those and make them available as sites to the different companies. So it was really one of those concepts, Chris, if you are a hockey person, that multiple shots on goal, some that you can get off quickly and, and ramp up quickly, some that have more experience, and some that we know are tried and true. So all of these things are going on. As I said publicly, and I believe it's true, that if we're gonna get a vaccine, which I am cautiously optimistic that we will get a safe and effective vaccine, that there will be multiple candidates using multiple platforms. I think we're gonna need that, Chris, because we have a responsibility to the entire planet, not just to the individual country that's mm -hmm. making the vaccine. So we're very well aware of that. And the reason why the companies that we're dealing with are already in discussion to start gearing up to make hundreds of millions of doses. And a couple of the companies are promising that they would have a billion doses within a year or so after it becomes. So multiple shots on goal, hopefully more than one success. Ubuntu, 
for the world. <laughs> right. It's really Ubuntu. Exactly. Thank you. Um, Dr. Karim, we, we heard uh, quite a lot from Ambassador Bergs about risk factors. And, you know, uh, around the world, there are a lot of extended families, multi-generational families living in poor housing uh, with very low income. Uh, and South Africa is not an exception to that. Can you outline some of the lessons that were learned from the severe lockdown as applied to that sort of community and how they responded? It was quite striking, uh, Dr. Posniak, the way in which people initially responded. There was a lot of support for the early action because there was some initial concern about what is this virus. But as we uh, continued under the first uh, initial strict lockdown, it became clear that there were certain challenges. One of those was the use of the military to try and ensure that people were safe. And there were some abuses which were very unfortunate and really deeply regretted. But as we've seen now, we've had several consequences of our early lockdown, one of which is the challenge that people had in going to healthcare services for their usual medications and so on. But perhaps one of the things that most impacted on what we were doing was that there was a lot of anxiety and fear that if they went anyway, if you went to the hospital, you went to the shop, you would acquire infection. So we had to overcome that through education, through engagement. And it's not just about telling people. It's about working with people to understand where their real concerns are and to overcome that and then to enable them to move to the next stage as we ease the lockdown. And now we're in this very awkward situation where we're easing the lockdown. We're now in week 15 of our lockdown. We had a very low level of walk, call it a very light lockdown right now. We sort of more or less minimal lockdown. But while we're in that situation, we have an increasing number of cases. I call this period, you know, it's a sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't. Because no matter what you do, you're in that contradiction of the cases going up, but you're easing your restrictions because you want those restrictions to be replaced by individual action. You want to be replaced by community action. And making that transition is the challenge that I refer to. And have you, just to follow up on that, have you seen community groups being formed and being as active, active as we've seen in the HIV arena? Very much so. Initially, I think people didn't really know what this was about, but it took a matter of you know six weeks, eight weeks into the epidemic, and we began to see the community activity and the community action. Uh, the churches played a big role in it, even though churches themselves were... Uh, gatherings were prohibited. And now, one of the ways that's become very obvious is that the government had a group of scientists that I lead, 51 scientists, mathematical modelers, clinicians, public health specialists, laboratory virologists, and we were the predominant advisors to the government. The government has now created a second ministerial advisory committee it was initiated about two weeks ago, which is really about community groups and 30 different individuals that represent a range of different sectors of community action have come together to really give the government that bolstering capability to now change from what we were doing, which is a public health focused response to one that's now a community based response. And that's really something we learned from HIV. We're just using many of the techniques that we learned and developed under HIV to more effective capability for COVID-19. It's not without its challenges, I don't want to make it sound romantic, but that's what we have to bank on in the absence of institutional control. Individuals got to assume that control. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Burks. I was just Go going to on. ask about the, um, sorry, Chris, about, about uh, the same happening in the United States in terms of engagement of community. You know, that has been um, really a very important question. Um, it's, it's why I was on the road for the last week um, out in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and then Florida to really 
um, work with not only the state and local health officials, but with community groups to really bring their voice and, and action to the table and making sure that they understood the importance of testing, household testing and knowing your status. So really build, bringing, bringing together, it's very difficult when you think of the individuals under 30 and you think that potentially up to 80% of them could either be asymptomatic or mild disease and asking them to come forward and be tested and self-isolate and ensure they're wearing masks and they're protecting their multi-generational households. This is a lot to ask of young people. And so really ensuring that we're reaching just like we had to in the AIDS community when we wanna prevent illness um, and, and we wanna prevent disease, we have to go to the young generational leaders and make sure that they're a voice in the community with their peers. And that's been, I think because it was a respiratory disease, that is not a tra tra usual approach for flu. Um, so really bringing that kind of HIV community voice and viewpoint to the response, I think is really quite, quite critical. I think we have time for one last short question, maybe, uh, Dr. Fauci, back to you. Ambassador Burks raised uh, this issue of pooled testing strategies uh, as an important uh, component of the next phase of the response. I wonder if you could talk to that as a, as a public health approach uh, to COVID control. Well, it, it could be a very important uh, component, Chris. It really is gonna depend upon how much penetrance of infection is in the community because in certain times if you have so much it doesn't work <laughs> that's the point um, so what you really need is to get a good idea in general of where you are and then apply that uh, you know there are different models that uh, deb and i <laughs> mostly deb are working on about trying to figure out what is the best statistical approach towards the relationship between what's in the community and the benefit of doing pooled, pool five, pool 10, pool more. It's complicated, but it does play a role and I'm sure is gonna have an important impact on what we do because as uh, Dr. Burks, uh, Ambassador Burks has mentioned, the situation that we're facing in the United States is significant and serious in that we have community spread in areas where many of these individuals are without symptoms. That is complicating our task. Thank you so much, everyone, for such an engaging discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for presenting and for connecting at such a busy and critical time. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for the support for the COVID-19 conference. Now, before the next plenary session, which will focus on the impact of COVID-19 beyond health, we encourage you to visit the conference program to view the amazing set of on-demand abstract sessions that are available. We wish you a nice morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you connected with us for this session. Goodbye.